Hello, and welcome to the Minted Dialogue Internet Show, number 56. And this is a first for this show. As you know, usually we talk about branding and digital marketing. But this time I've recorded the show based on one of my deeply personal passions, and something that has been driving me for some 21 years. It regards history, and specifically a part of World War II history, that has been left outside of the normal focus. I had the chance to catch up with Professor Jan Thompson just before she had the world premiere of her feature-length production entitled Never the Same, The Prisoner of War Experience. I hope you will enjoy the hiatus from the normal digital marketing topic to listen to Jan's remarkable story. Hello and welcome to the Minted Dialogue show. Today I have a very special guest and it's on a very different topic than you've ever imagined. Because today it's a very personal story. And uh, so I have on the phone or on Skype, piped in from the States, Jan Thompson. So Jan, tell us uh, who you are, what you do, and, and what's about to happen. Uh, yes. Hi, Minter. Um, I'm a filmmaker, and I've been working on a documentary for about 22 years. And it's finally going to have its premiere in Chicago um, at the Gene Siskel Film Center. And the documentary is called Never the Same, The Prisoner of War Experience. So you've been 22 years on this topic. I know before this you had the tragedy of Bataan. Yes. Uh, it, what does it feel like to be at the cusp of actually making it go live? Well, I'm uh, very terrified. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, when you work on something for so long... It, uh, you you hope that um, you hope you don't miss the mark. You hope that an audience will understand what you've done because it is such a complex topic, um, and the stories that these men tell. There's so much dark humor that I'm. Uh, it'll be uh, curious to see how an audience is going to respond to a lot of the dark humor. All right. So let, let's tell us about Never the Same. What is Never the Same? Never the, uh, Never the Same is, uh, is a program about how the men um, survived as prisoners of war under Imperial Japan, as captives of um, the Japanese during World War II. <clears throat> and I use the men, primarily the men that had been um, surrendered in the Philippines to tell the story, but how they survived could be used, you know, to understand possibly how those who were captured in Hong Kong, Singapore, the Dutch East Indies, there are a lot of similarities of what went on into the camps, uh, et cetera, the work details. And the, so the program covers really about how they, how they survived, not a day-to-day, but how they kept their sanity. Um, uh, there's a, a section on there about the hell ships that almost – Anybody who was a POW uh, had been on a hell ship, and it's a story that really isn't known. A lot of um, POWs have told me that they think the hell ships were probably the worst experience uh, or the worst part of their experience as, uh, as a POW. Um, and so it, it, it starts essentially with you know captivity all the way, and it goes through liberation. And I use... I use the camp in Mukden, Manchuria as the example of how a camp was liberated. Mm -hmm. Well, you, like I, have a personal relationship to this whole thing in that your father was one of the POWs. So the question I have for you is, is how did it start? What was the, you know, the crystallizing moment that started this journey 22 years ago? And why did you wait till then kind of thing? <clears throat> well, it, it's an interesting question, Minter, in that, Many POW kids, and I consider myself a kid of a POW, uh, often their dads or granddads, whoever it was the POW, would not talk about it. And then there, and that is exactly what happened when I was growing up. And it was this whole thing where you're also trying to respect that if you wanted to ask questions, it might bring up horrendous memories. After my dad's dad died. My dad was an only child. Uh, a suitcase arrived from my grandfather hmm. and it was in the attic. And my mom said, go through it because I'm going to toss stuff. I'm going to throw stuff out. My mom's 
almost like Martha Stewart. She cleans, etc. So, you know, late one night I dragged this thing out to take a look at it. Um, and in there is my father's prisoner of war badge. Um, cards, uh, they were permitted to, to write on three by five cards from the prison camps. The Red Cross cards. But, you're right. Uh, you know, what was going on. I mean, they were limited to 25 words, I think. Um, so there was this artifact, letters, uh, that, that never got to him, that m his mother had written him. I mean, a, a, mm -hmm. a pile of 50, 60 letters, you know, return to cinder, return to cinder. And it just, it was, it was an archive in itself. It was put together as if, hey, somebody do something with this material don't let anybody forget in case, I guess my dad didn't, didn't come back, but I mean, they kept it even after he came back, obviously. Mm -hmm. So that gave me the courage to, and I was, you know, in my uh, late twenties, early thirties, I guess, to my dad was starting to go to prisoner of war conventions, reunions. And I said, dad, I want to go with you to one of these. And, uh, went and, uh, Heard stories that I'd never heard of before. Met met so many remarkable men, uh, fun men, and uh, and I walked out of that convention after like four days, saying, "Why doesn't anybody know anything about this?" Mm -hmm. And that's what got me started. And then, but the thing is, I didn't I didn't commit myself for like two years. I, I started doing research. I started going to to reunions. But even dur during those two years, I I knew I had there was there was something really good here, but I also knew this was not going to be easy. I knew that this was not going to be easy to create to produce mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons, and uh, and I was right. Not least of which is the politics and the lack of images for a film. Yes. So. Um, you have met a lot of people who went through uh, this experience that your father went through, uh, like my grandfather. Tell us uh, one or two interesting or most significant interviews that you uh, came across in, in your research. Well, I think I, there's, there's uh, well, all of them were, were golden, and of course the diaries. Uh, but I think I think there's a, there's a couple that definitely stand out, and I hope and they're in the program, and I hope you know an audience responds to them like how I responded. Um, there's uh, a section with the arm breaker of the prison camp. Some of the work details were so brutal that the men started to deliberately hurt themselves to get out of work to try to stay back in camp. There, there were like camp hospitals, if you would call them that, and there would be doctors, and they would be able to hold back a few, few of the POWs, but not all of them. And um, I came across during this, this reunion these two guys who were friends, and one was the arm breaker, and the other guy was a friend who he had tried to break his arm but was not successful. And it's, it's really dark. And it's really funny. I have it cut back to back as they're talking about how, you know, they're under the barracks and he's whacking the guy's <laughs> arm and it won't break, whack it again, won't break. And then finally the guy said, look, forget it. I'm going to go back to work. And the arm breaker said, well, you're not getting your cigarettes back. I mean, because that was the payment. Mm -hmm. um, so so <laughs> I, was, I was kind of dumbfounded. I mean, I had heard some other stories but um and then the other the other one that really stands out is with uh, eugene nielsen who was one of the uh palawan massacre survivors mm -hmm. and um i had discovered that he was at a reunion that i was at and i had a film crew coming in the next morning and i tracked down his daughter and spoke to the, his daughter and said look i'd really like to interview your dad if possible and she said jan he just can't usually get through this. I mean, he he's never been able to really sit down with anybody and get through the entire uh, massacre. I'll ask if he wants to, and, and we'll give it a try, but, you know, the odds are he's not going to get through it. 
And, and I asked, you know, I asked her, what was his personal story? What, you know, what happened to him specifically? Because I knew about the massacre, but, you know, everybody has their own personal story. And one of the points that she, she elaborated on was how he remembers it starting was when they were uh, forced down into bunkers. The massacres where the Japanese forced 150 POWs down into air raid bunkers and poured gasoline, set them on fire so that when the men were trying to escape, they were machine gunned, okay, uh, and or bayoneted, you name it. Mm-hmm. And she said that the starting point for her dad with this massacre is when one of the fellows stuck his head up to see what the heck was going on. This is before they had poured the gasoline, and he was beheaded. Mm-hmm. And that's when, apparently, then everything just started to happen. Mm-hmm. Well, to make a long story short, when I sat down with Eugene Nielsen, um, it, I was on pins and needles. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I usually will do an interview chronologically, and this massacre happened in December of 1944, and I started to talk about his experiences in 1942, and he he started to break down at that very early, and I'm thinking, I'll I'll never get to the massacre, sure, but yeah. he stayed with me, and finally, after 45 minutes, I thought, well, I've got, I've got to get to the massacre. I've got another interview right behind him, and so I threw up, and I hoped that he would, you know, this would trigger, and mm-hmm. I said, did you ever see anybody get beheaded? And he said, well, you know, that's how the massacre started, mm-hmm. and then he started and he didn't stop. He didn't break down. Mm. He went on for another 40 minutes. It's some of the most powerful stuff I've ever heard. Mm-hmm. And, you know, obviously after that interview, I was like exhausted, mm-hmm. wet rag. It yeah. was, but he was, it was a remarkable, it was just a remarkable story. Mm. And you guess your interview afterwards fell, fell a little bit late, but how many people survived? I'm sorry? How many people survived the Palawan? The Massacre 11. Mm-hmm. So, Jan, you've got this, um, your premiere is coming out on Saturday. What, what do you hope is the message that your audience will take away? Well, it's, um, well, I'm hoping what happens is, is that they, they fall in love with the men, as I have, and that, that they'll remember their stories and, and by doing so, they're helping preserve uh, the history of what happened uh, to these men. You know, the major message throughout the film is man's inhumanity to man. Um, and that can be, I think, interpreted on several several different levels, you know, whether it's, you know, the Japanese and how brutal and cruel they were to the hell ships where... Um, you know, they're unmarked, but it, but most deaths on the hell ships, you know, was coming from American bombers because Mm -hmm. they were not marked. Um, you know, to even maybe the atom bomb, um, that, you know, war is terrible. It's funny. We should be talking today on, what are we, the 4th of April with uh, what's going on in North Korea. So, You are an associate professor in radio and television at the, um, with this Illinois... Southern, right. I'm I'm actually been promoted to full professor. Oh, cool. Congratulations. (laughs) Um, Um, For those academics who are out there. Exactly. Uh, Get those credits in. So, uh, yes, I'm at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, which is a very uh, remote area down in, in the southern part of the state of Illinois, so, and that in itself was making it sort of difficult and challenging because of um, being so remote. But um, with the power of the Internet, mm-hmm. uh, I was able to, and and because of things that have happened with archives now putting uh, a lot of their material right. on the Internet, I'm able you know, to access some of this stuff. And I traveled to Chicago because I also have a... Uh, a place where I live in Chicago and um, I was traveling on a, on a train and I was doing research in the Australian archives uh, 
Online. And and the Imperial War Museum <laughs> while I'm on a train in the middle of Illinois, which I think is kind of, uh, it's remarkable. I mean, I, I still get, ex- you know, dumbfounded how I can fly in an airplane with 200 other people sitting in, in seats, you know. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, the Internet has, has really helped um, in the last couple of years on this project. And so, I mean, I, I too have seen numerous articles reappearing and thanks to the fact that they've not only scanned the documents but have created the text words that are findable by google Mm -hmm. so all of a sudden you've got all you know and i just see it keep on coming online and uh, it's sort of like a never-ending opportunity to research and find out what's going on my question for you is going to be um you know, you've been a you're now full press professor in radio and television. How have you managed to do this on the side, or is it really a part of just to understand how you've operated? <laughs> because I can imagine it's quite kind time consuming uh, doing a film. Uh, yeah, um, and yes, <laughs> um, I, I'm um, I'm. I'm also, I, I, I think I, it's safe to say, a pretty popular teacher. So um, I always have students coming to me with their own projects mm-hmm. and trying to mentor them. It's not like someplace where I can hide in the ivory tire, tower, which some people think that some people are able to do. Mm-hmm. But um, what, what had one benefit, you know, one thing that did help out, at least being at a university, and being in this remote area, is I had I'd been really reluctant of filming reenactments for this mm-hmm. project. Mm-hmm. I just there's more you know there's a lot of cheesy to use the term that my students use you know stuff that's out there and it, mm-hmm. and it's really hard. Um, but I thought I've got to try because the as a the challenge to this program was there's not a lot of visuals out there and. The, the material is good. I have to have something visual. So I, you know, I re- recreated a camp down in southern Illinois, you know, a bamboo forest. Believe it or not, there's a bamboo forest down there. Mm-hmm. Um, using barns. Um, I recreated uh, the whole of a hell ship by being down below a stage, uh, a theatrical stage. Mm-hmm. Um so I mean, there there was some opportunities that you know I had to be really creative. And if you're if you're doing a project like this, you kind of like you know you got to squeeze it all out to figure out how you're going to do some stuff. Right. But um, but it ended up working well. And then of course, um, <laughs> I'll give you one one little bit of information. The hell ships, you know, the men were crammed below, and I needed a lot of skinny white males. Okay, uh-huh. and I ended up getting the long distance track team from the university and and they're like, yeah, they're like skin and bones. And so a few, um, few high jumpers probably too. Well, yeah, but I mean, you know, and they weren't afraid to take their shirts off. I mean, this is the other thing, you know, when you're sometimes dealing with actors or something like that, um, people are nervous of, but, you know, runners, they mm-hmm. run all the time and they take their shirts off, so mm-hmm. there's no problem. Well, they had to be sweaty, they had to be cramped together That's all right. the same so to make it uh, realistic. Mm. So, Jan, you've, um, how long did the film take to, to, to produce? I mean, after you've done the research, there's the, the creation of the film. How long did it take to do it? It's taken a, about 22 years. Oh, boy. Right, but the, the filming of it, the, the putting together of the material, is there's that, I mean, you, as an editor... Either did it start? Well, 22 years well ago? I'm collecting. You know, throughout the time I'm interviewing men, so I you're see. seeing a change in technology because mm-hmm. I go to reunions. Um, the last several years was spent mainly on trying to animate a lot of the drawings mm-hmm. and cartoons, and then these last two years um, is was filming the reenactments, and one of the things that also happened i had essentially in my opinion had finished the program uh last year um i um uh, i have an actor i'm not sure if, if your people would know who he is alec baldwin oh yeah okay and alec reads one of the main diaries mm-hmm. 
but I had been struggling trying to find a female narrator. I, I From day one, I knew I wanted a female narrator. I needed a, a different type of quality of voice up against all these men. Mm-hmm. And I was kind of desperate. And uh, I got very lucky and was able to get through to Loretta Swit. And she's uh, a pretty famous actress here in... Um, in the United States, she was in a uh, television series called MASH. Oh, yeah. And uh, as she... Hot Lips. Oh, yeah, of course. Okay. Oh, my gosh, yes. And so when she, when I sent her the script, she knew exactly where I was going. Mm-hmm. You know, she didn't have any qualms either. I mean, because you never know how someone's going to react to some of your material. Sure. Mm-hmm. And she said, um, where else can I help? And I said, you know, I could use a cut, some... I'd like to get some more voices if possible. Now, I had already used amateur actors, okay? Mm -hmm. And I already had them recorded. I mean, I was running all over the place recording people. Mm -hmm. And um, she says, well, let me call a few of my friends. Alan. (laughs) Huh? Alan. I was thinking of Alda. Right, right. Well, well, Alan Alda's not in it. but (laughs) I'm just kidding. But as as a result of of this, you know, Ed Asner, uh, Sam Waterston, Kathleen Turner, Mike uh, Farrell... Robert Wagner, uh, it goes on. And then I had to, you know, travel to New York city and record people, uh, and to, to California. So then for like three or four weeks, I was traveling all over the country trying to get these people because they're reading diaries, they're reading recipes, they're (laughs) reading poems. Um, so that in itself. So, I mean, that was, that just like exploded. Oh, sure. Well, that's yeah. great to have those kind of people attached to the story on top of that. Yes. So, um, 22 years of studying this and, and you, you got it, you had the chance to, to accompany your father to these POW conventions. How has this whole process and journey impacted you personally and your family? Well, my dad never understood why I devoted my, so much time to this and my own money and pretty much in the whole Mm-hmm. Big time. Um, and part of, I think part of it also is, is that nobody had really taken an interest in their stories before. I think that's, and you know this, there's not a lot of material out there. There's books, but there's not a lot of films. There's mm-hmm. just not a lot of stuff out there if you try to compare it to other mm-hmm. parts of history. Um, so it was this, you know, you know, when you make a promise or when you say, I'm going to do something, you know, you're honor bound. At least I felt I was. Mm-hmm. And it becomes that, a mission. I'm sorry? It becomes a mission. It, well, it becomes a mission and that these men trusted me to sit down and tell their stories to me that some of these stories they had not even told their own children. Mm-hmm. I felt, okay, I've got to get this out. And so... I, my dad passed away last year. Um, I think he was appreciative, but I think, you know, it was, uh, I, I know that I think he's, he's glad that the, the story is being told Mm -hmm. as an impact on my, my family. Um, I think my, my family's happy, you know, uh, it's done. <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, They're happy. Mom, you know, you know, the weekly, the Saturday morning phone right. calls and she'd say, well, what are you doing this weekend? I said, I'm editing. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm writing music, you know, cause I write the music for the entire film. Oh, wow. And so it's, you know, but it's also, it's part of my fabric. I think mm-hmm. it's probably part of your fabric too. Absolutely. It's, uh, even though the, f- I think the film is done. Um, I'm going to probably tweak some things, but uh, even though the film is done, it, I'm working on a play just on the hell ships. Mm-hmm. I know that I, I might be doing another project with Alec Baldwin. We're discussing the possibility of something else. Mm. So, um, you know, it's, it's a part of me. Mm, totally. All right, Jen. So we're coming out Saturday. Uh, we are approaching the anniversary of the Bataan death march. Yes. And National POW Recognition Day, which is on the 9th. Yes. Uh, so beautiful timing in this respect. Was that planned? I don't know. But how can, uh, how can we hope? What are, the, what are your hopes for the film and how can people uh, know more about your film? Well, the hopes for the film is that the audience understands it. They understand the dark humor. They laugh where it's okay to laugh. Right. Um, I, uh, 
there had been an article that just came out this week in the Chicago Tribune, and as a result of this article, this 95-year-old man kept calling the department at my university saying he was a POW, and he, was, he wanted to come to the film. So I finally got through to him yesterday, and he is. He's somebody who I don't know, but he had been surrendered on Corregidor, mm. and he's coming to the film um, on Sunday, and... Uh, He's and I said, well, you know, you're going to be my test baby. You, you know, there's a lot of dark humor here, and mm -hmm. I, it's going to be interesting for me to, to see how you respond to this film. No kidding. So I, I, I hope I, I truly hope that the the audience, you know, um, let's see, responds, you know, that they're not afraid to laugh because that's was part of a survival mechanism for the men, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and if people want to see the trailer, I have a, uh, I have a website. It's still kind of a work in progress mm -hmm. at www.nts-pow.com. Um, and the trailer is on there. The, uh, I hope to get it into more theaters, um, uh, and then hopefully a broadcast deal. Well, if there's a petition, you know, I'm a signer yes. <laughs> getting it into the other theaters and, uh, it's I really hope that your premiere goes beautifully. I'm, I'm sure that that's going to be a, an experience by itself, especially now you have a, a first-hand uh, audience, exactly the target you're looking at. Mm -hmm. So, Jan, thanks for spending some time with me uh, to talk about this. It's a shared passion, and I'm thrilled to have had this opportunity to know a little bit more about it from the inside. And, uh, gosh, I hope it uh, really gets distributed, because this story needs to be told. So... Thank you so much, Minter. Really, and thank you for giving me this opportunity. It's my pleasure. So thanks for having listened to this very special recording of the Minter Dialogue Show. Usually you find the show notes on themindset.com. This time I've chosen to publish it on minterdial.com, where you can find all the show notes. Of course, if you like the show, please rate it in iTunes, and don't forget to click on the handy Facebook like button or tweet it out. In the meantime, you can come join the conversation at The Mindset or catch me on Twitter at M-D-I-A-L-M-D-I-A-L. Happy trails. I'm